I'm Britt Garner. And I'm Rob Spall. Welcome to Nature Insight. Speed dating with the future. We're so excited to be back with the second season of our ITFIS podcast, sharing the latest insights into our work on the science of biodiversity with unique perspectives from those on the front lines of research, policy, and action for nature. So Brit, I'm still here in Bonn, Germany, and still working mostly from home. When we recorded our first season last year, we were under lockdown. And although that got better with vaccinations, words like Delta and Omicron are really starting to make me dislike the Greek alphabet. <laughs> but Brit, your, your changes since season one have really been a little more extreme, right? You were in Montana when we heard you last, howling daily with the wolves. But uh, you made the move to the Big Apple, to New York. Yes, as a very competitive person, I decided that doing the most drastic thing would uh, certainly put me ahead <laughs> in the game of pandemic catch-up. Um, I had an amazing opportunity to become a science teacher this year after finishing my PhD over the summer of 2021. And so I am here and daily getting to experience not howling with the wolves, though I do think seventh and ninth graders are, are decently close. <laughs> I will say it's so great to be back for our second series. And although some things haven't changed at all, some things feel like they are worlds away from where we are. And I mean, we're still speed dating with the future, Rob. Absolutely, Britt. And it seems to me it's even more urgent and important now than it was last year. So for our new listeners, real speed dating is about making a lasting impression in just a few moments. And we're going to try and do the same with you here on Nature Insight. We'll be introducing you to experts and stakeholders working on the cutting edge of biodiversity and the contributions that we all get from nature. We're all a part of this wider community of the organization that I work for, IPBES. IPBES. Hmm. Yes. Wait for it. <laughs> the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. Bravo. So, Rob, how about a, a very brief snapshot of what you do? Well, we bring together the best available science about nature, and we present evidence-informed solutions to help people make better choices, to agree better policies, and to take better actions for people and for our planet. Was that short enough? I'll allow it. IPBIS usually focuses our communication on decision makers, but the changes we're all making to nature and to biodiversity affect every one of us. And it's really fascinating having come from Montana and now living in one of the most intensely human built environments. The change in habitat for me has been extraordinary, and yet there is still the impact felt by this connection to the natural world and what that's meant as far as our journey with the pandemic. One of the things that IPBIS has worked on since we recorded season one of the podcast was a workshop on the links between the loss of biodiversity and the impacts of that on the increasing risks of pandemics. And one of the things that came out of that workshop, one of the key messages was exactly this, that the choices we've made to extract more resources have damaged environments, damaged ecosystems, and brought us as people much more closely into contact with the risks of greater pandemics through carriers and through other species that perhaps have passed those to us through zoonosis. Now, talking about choices, one of the things that I've been able to do since we last spoke was travel a little bit more. Here in Germany, when lockdown lifted, I was able to move around and particularly on public transport. But again, it was different. Suddenly we had masks everywhere and as much social distancing as the German train system would allow. Next stop, Bonn Central Station. Now, here's a sound that you won't, or perhaps you shouldn't, hear on public transport anywhere. You'd be surprised. The New York City subway can get decently fascinating at certain points, but you're right. I don't <laughs> think that sound has been uh, has been in the in the lineup. Though I will say, it is a sound that absolutely fascinated our first guest when she was growing up in Namibia. Britt, I'm really excited about our first guest. To be an IPBIS author, you would normally have to be one of the very best in your field. And typically that means decades of research success behind you. But the IPBIS Fellowship Program provides an opportunity for 
early career researchers from all backgrounds and disciplines to get involved in IPAS's assessments and to work very closely with some of the leaders in their fields as full co-authors of our reports. And I connected so strongly to Leilani Maurice Minetti, who's actually a conservation ecologist from Namibia who is an IPIS fellow. She's been working on the IPIS values assessment in particular, which we actually talked about in episode six of our first season. Leilani is a postdoctoral fellow at Georgia State University's Urban Studies Institute, and she's conducting interdisciplinary research on resilient urban futures. But what I wanted to know at first was what sparked Leilani's interest in conservation ecology. Well, my earliest passion was lions. Uh, I was fascinated by them. I absolutely adored lions. I had a room full of posters of, of just lions, as compared to many of my friends that had a whole bunch of teeny bopper things on their walls. <laughs> I always had my mom go out and get me posters about lions. And so I started, went, and I went on and I studied conservation at Stellenbosch University in South Africa, carried on for four years and then did a master's where I realized that it wasn't so much about the lions, it was about the people that were living close to these protected areas that were putting pressure on their protected areas. So that's where I started incorporating the social aspects in my research, started doing social ecological research, and that became my passion. Very shortly after that, realizing how important policy was, and then it became a natural progression to then include technological aspects. And now my passion is social, ecological, technological systems and studying those in the urban context. It's so fascinating because we're from completely different parts of the world, and yet our journeys actually align really interestingly. For me, it was sharks. So clearly we've got the claws and jaws situation going on. (laughs) I love that. And so I went in and did zoology conservation, wildlife conservation, but then really started realizing that pretty much almost... All of wildlife conservation was human management and thinking about the things driving the decisions. So you received the fellowship and you decided to go for it. Uh, What was that kind of beginning like? The beginning was overwhelming. I am not even going to pretend. (laughs) Very fair. Once you're actually there and you see all these people and all these experts from around the world, when you hear the accents and where they're all from and their disciplines, and you see somehow how they're interconnected, and then you hear about all these other structures. And then when you know when you kind of calm down a little bit, you look around the room and you see people that you have been citing all these years. And I think that's you know that's kind of pinch me moment. Amazing. That I think was overwhelming. And then just being able to meet all these amazing people, and then figuring out how you're going to keep this network going and keep the friendships going. You kind of, you calm yourself down because you know that when you need to deal with something down the line, whether that is, you know, negotiations during the plenary, you will get there. You'll get the necessary training, the necessary capacity building. I know the, I think it was the Global Assessment Fellows, or they've now become the alumni. They have a song to kind of get across all these acronyms because in IPES there are plenty of acronyms. (laughs) Indeed. And they've got this cool song and I still don't know all of them, but sometimes I just go back to, you know, humming that. (laughs) You know we're dying to hear it, so we're going to have to find that song. Amazing. You know, a fight song, which how does it get better than that? (laughs) (laughs) A little war cry. So as an IPBIS fellow, you're working within your research institute. You are doing postdoc work, but then you are also working with mentor and with a team for assessment. How does that time kind of get allocated to both of these huge endeavors? Well, initially, when you apply, it does say that you're expected to dedicate 15% of your time in some way or another to the assessment. And then there's also different phases, right, during an assessment. Because if things are due, you're going to spend all your time on on the assessment and getting something done. But a, t- a typical day would be, uh, you know, checking in with uh, the, the rest of your section or your chapter, being sure of what your role is, what you need to be doing. Because remember, this is way bigger than your little section. And then kind of going back and then making sure that you do it to the highest caliber of of your own skill set, of what you know is out there and your capacities. 
And then there are these capacity building phases where we actually go, the fellows would go for a week or so and we would have training. It has been done online um, recently, but that also looks different. It, sometimes it's just on data visualization. Other times it is how to communicate your science. It really does vary. There really isn't a structure that I would say to somebody, your Monday to Friday or your January to December looks like this because it really does vary. And what they allow you to do really is up to you and which whatever leadership structure you find yourself in. In my chapter, they really treated me as a peer. So essentially, whatever we were doing, I was you know seen on equal ground. We all did the work together. Academic research projects in general, they're they're often very exclusive. I mean, it's very hard to come in or break in. And yet with the fellowship over the three years, not only are you being exposed, but I mean, you're actually a co-author on these pieces of the assessment, correct? It's a fast forward mechanism, if I could put it that way, that the fellows are then given the seat at the table. And instead of waiting two decades to be able to do and affect that change, we can do it now, we can start now. When you see your own work kind of being incorporated into the assessment, I think that's also just a wow. Though I don't have this long list of publications, but my work, my publications, my contributions are being incorporated. What I'm doing matters and it does matter down the line. Yeah. And then also importantly, you start networking because the people that I have met, whether those are fellow fellows or other experts, the work still continues, this type of work being exposed in these arenas to doing these types of assessments at the policy interface means it influences uh, your work as well. Yeah, and, and that makes perfect sense. And I like the idea of it being a matter of urgency. It's not just for fun. It's that we, we need the right now. So why not take exceptional early career researchers that can do this? Um, you mentioned the, the fellow fellows, which I love that. <laughs> Me and my fellow fellows. Can you tell us a little bit over the three years of your fellowship, what that's been like and how it's potentially changed or grown? The fellow fellows and the support that has been offered through that relationship has been immense. I think that's probably one of the best takeaways that I will take from this we're from different disciplines, different countries, still early career, but some of us at different stages. Uh, within this a group of fellows, I've also had uh, formed closer friendships. So we're a group of, of four, we call it the buddies, because we had this buddy system when we were in Morocco, where we just didn't want to lose each other. So we kind of buddied up. <laughs> but these are my values buddies. And it's Anna in Russia, it's Ranjini in India. And then it's Yvonne that's in Tokyo right now. And we're all just, you know, at this difficult stage in our lives, difficult stage in our careers, and then trying to do an assessment during COVID. And we've just been, you know, this amazing support uh, to each other. And these are people that I can see myself working with in my future career, wherever I end up. Support in COVID has been immense. We did our third authors meeting entirely online. And then just, you know, when I think back of, those virtual hugs and Patty's laugh, one of the four co-chairs of the values assessment. And just, you know, you can, you can just feel them in the room with you and on a virtual call all alone in your apartment in the middle of Atlanta. And you can actually feel somebody from across the world in the room with you. Uh, and that's because of that, that special relationship that has been and that bond that has been formed. Oh, certainly. That during COVID and doing all these virtual things... With IPES, it really has been, as corny as it may sound, it really was real. And that's probably because it, it really, it was way beyond a working relationship. It really didn't matter what our titles were, or who we are in terms of status and where we're from. It was a supportive network of people that were just really looking out for each other. How do diverse perspectives that are coming from fellows from all around the world and all different backgrounds, how do those perspectives enrich the assessments themselves, in your case, the, the values assessment? As you can imagine, values themselves are diverse. So it just makes sense to have diverse perspective, diverse ways of seeing things, diverse ways of researching, of conceptualizing. And instead of having to research a lot of these folks, they would be on the assessment. So you would reach out to somebody and you would say, hey, Tieni, I know you're working in Mexico. How, how are things done there? Are you okay to do a 30-minute Zoom call and go over something? It's not just that methodological approach that is diverse. It's just that way that it's synthesized and brought together. This is generally an unpaid fellowship, so this is not, you know, salaried or monthly uh, paycheck. And yet it sounds like there are many people who are able to participate. Can you tell me a little bit about those barriers to entry and 
if there are things in place to help? The entire assessment is unpaid. Essentially, all of us, coordinating lead authors, fellows, lead authors, we're all doing it as a service to the profession. The fellowship does offer developing countries and people from developing countries financial assistance to attend the author meetings and the capacity building events, which typically happen once a year. So we are funded. But those that are not from developing countries, they would then have to find their own funds, whether that is out of pocket or the institutions would need to support them. So they are they are barriers to entry. Even though your travel is paid for, you still would then have to either take off time from work or arrange childcare. But still, we find a way to make it work because the technical support unit are very supportive in how they kind of wrangle these various challenges. You said doing it at the service of, of the profession, which is an incredibly graceful way of, of reminding us that the kind of work being done, right, this is not a get-rich-quick scheme. This is very much so dedication to the thing itself and that passion and, and understanding of the work together. Mentorship is a big part of the IPIS Fellowship. What is the mentorship aspect like? How has that been for you? The idea of mentorship really is between you and whoever your mentor then becomes. That's a relationship you have to define in the beginning. So we've all taken this in different directions, whether, you know, you want to publish with your mentor, whether in my situation, it's more of a support uh, system and whatever has attracted them to their mentor. It could be the fact that they're in the same discipline, could be the fact that they're in completely different disciplines. I know some folks that were so Outside in terms of time zone, they were the only two people in that time zone and they just decided, okay, hey, why don't we form a mentee mentor bond so that we don't have to phone people at 3 a.m.? <laughs> but yeah, the mentorship again has been just another way of opening your eyes to different ways, different things, and then just always knowing that there's that one person you could go to. My mentor, Juliana, is in my chapter, but she's not on my section. So it was also useful to check in with her sometimes in terms of relationships and how I should be coordinating with with my fellow authors in my section. So I know for me, as a first year teacher um, at the school I'm at, they pair a veteran teacher with first year teachers. So coming in, we each are paired up and we have someone. And I know that even though I'm gaining so much from Alicia, my mentor, she's also saying at times that she's getting things from me, that we're able to have this back and forth, which is really lovely. Can you think of examples where Juliana has been able to influence you or that even more interestingly, that you've been able to influence her? What I was drawn to initially was this, because I knew that she she worked on indigenous knowledge systems. And then also there was a situation during our first author meeting, we were doing, you know, as you can, I think it was the third or fourth day, everybody's tired, it's already late in the evening, and we had to decide on something. And there was just one of those situations, power dynamics came into play. And Juliana stepped up in just a way that really drew me to her. And because I myself do the scenario facilitation in the work that I do, and I know that I've struggled with power dynamics and conflict in these situations. So seeing her doing that and seeing her doing it so gracefully, I was like, okay, I think I found my mentor. Mm -hmm. She went through a lot with COVID and just being able to also myself be there for her. Mentorship does go two ways. And I know that there are situations where mentors have been able to learn either new skill sets or new ways of doing things, something maybe that's a bit more cutting edge or innovative that's not so much in their field. I think that has been uh, useful in, in the mentorship program. You are toward the end of this three-year fellowship. I know that you've accomplished so much in that amount of time. Is there any big thing that's still left? All of this work that you've been doing, what happens to this, this journey? Where, where is it headed next for you? For me personally, it's it's going to plenary. That basically involves the coordinating lead authors and the policymakers going line by line through the assessment. What gets said, where are the gaps, what should be done, and how do we say it? And then they have to agree on that. Amazing. So that's that's huge. It's like you do all this work, but then that next step is still around the corner. And that's incredibly exciting. So much of your work is thinking about future capacity and scenarios and uh what kind of makes you hopeful about the future as, as you end and conclude this IPIS fellowship? There's a lot more work waiting for us, but just seeing all these passionate people willing to give, even during a time of virtual, working from home, weird, absolutely, we don't know what tomorrow brings situations. People are still 
passionate about making it work, about making these assessments a success. That has really made me hopeful. And then being able to see how your work can affect that change, can contribute to affecting that change, has kind of made me want to do another assessment because you know now, I now know what the value is by identifying gaps and then filling those gaps, right? Not waiting for another catastrophe or another crisis or another window of opportunity, but being proactive in filling those gaps and contributing to this plausible, better, desired future that we all so much want and need. And I am so happy to be right there with you as we journey forward to these next chapters. Thank you so much, Leilani. I really, really appreciate it. Look forward to seeing you on one of the assessments, Britt. Oh, the gauntlet has been thrown. I might just get my seventh grade students. What do you think? I, I would love that. It could be like the mini fellows. I love that, especially especially because I work on scenarios. I know that I'm talking about their future. So having some of them involved around the table would be absolutely beautiful. I must say the idea of the seventh graders sitting around the table discussing policy and the idea of their futures is actually pretty awesome when I think about it. I really do love the fact that for the IPIS Fellowship Program, there is a sense of this collaboration and multiple ideas and people learning from each other and getting to be a part of the conversation. Absolutely, Britt. It, it's something that's really close to my heart, this idea that groups of people are being involved in work and, and discussions that affect everybody's futures. I mean, the fellows obviously are one part of that, the idea of your seventh graders perhaps being involved. A another group of people that perhaps you wouldn't immediately expect to be involved in the science of biodiversity is the private sector, the business sector. And it was also a group we talked about in season one as important decision makers for nature. At IPUS, we've been very fortunate to secure some financial support from business to help these early career researchers get involved in the IPUS assessments through the fellowship program. Yes, and I caught up with Juliette Prieur from AXA's Research Fund. They're one of the world's largest insurance companies and have been supporting biodiversity projects since 2018. Now, the AXA Research Fund is planning on making a significant financial contribution specifically to the fellowship program. So I asked Juliette why they see this and the work of IPIS as deserving of their support. Actually, a couple of years ago, we were thinking about reshaping our grants and we asked ourselves, where do we have the most impact? And uh, we really realized that supporting young researchers is really fundamental because they, they, they can be at a point of their young career where they can ask themselves, okay, shall I be a scientist or should I do something completely different? And so we, we really understood also by talking with, our, with the young scientists that we already support that sometimes they spend more time looking for funding rather than actually doing research. So it's really important for us to support them in helping them to achieve what they want to achieve. And what is also really great is that with this uh, support, we're going to help specifically researchers from the global south. And we know that it's even more difficult for them sometimes to get funded. So it adds a social angle to our support. And it's super fascinating to me that an insurer, somebody, a group that works on mitigating risk would do something like say, you know, these people that are early in career or might not typically have this kind of an opportunity. You know what? We are people that mitigate risk and yet we want to take a risk in investing in young people. Sometimes it's totally okay for us to to go for the research who will be probably the more risky, but also, which will probably open the, the best uh, path, because if we don't take action, then who will? With this financial contribution, AXA doesn't get any special access or influence over assessments or processes. So what is the actual return on investment for AXA as a company, as a group? As an insurer, I think we really need to understand what's going on in the world and what are the main issues that shape the earth. And we really need to rely on science to, to better mitigate, to better understand, and also to better ensure the main risk. 
and how we measure the impact of our grants is really on the researcher's career. So I think our return on investment is really when researchers manage to carry out their projects in a great way until the end and the way they wanted to, to do it. And at AXA, we really see the biodiversity crisis as a major one. What we try to do at the AXA Research Fund is really to try to establish the connection between researchers and business experts. So we like to say that we help science getting out of the lab so that the greatest number of people can get access to science to make the best decision in their, on the business side or daily life. And as you mentioned, with climate crisis and biodiversity crisis, we're also all getting our our own version of a return on investment, just as humans and other (laughs) species and organisms uh, navigating the challenges. So I can completely understand that. In general, looking forward, how do you see the link between business and research evolving? What are some of those future uh, ideas or where do you see that going? People sometimes tend to think that research and business are completely different. They are not linked. And you have basically scientists in their in their lab on one corner and you have a really serious guy doing business on the other side of, uh, of the world. But I mean, at AXA, we don't view things that way. We really think that research and business are connected and that research feed business and the other way around. Those issues of climate change, of biodiversity loss are really global ones and everyone should yeah, join forces to find solution and to make the earth a better place to live in the, in the future years. How great it's been, Britt, to hear both from one of the members of the fellowship program and a supporter of the fellowship program, to hear both sides of that equation. The fellowship is one of the parts of our work at IPBIS that I find most exciting. And I think we're going to be talking a lot this season about different kinds of values. The fellowship program has so much potential to create and add value for policymakers who receive better evidence, for IPBIS to benefit from the energy and the perspectives of the fellows, and for the participants themselves who get to experience such an opportunity to work with some of the leaders in their fields and to publish with them. You know, and that idea of the street being two ways as far as a mentor and mentee both getting to learn from each other actually in an interesting way reminds me of the way that both science and policy get to learn from each other, particularly when we look at what IPBIS does on the grander scale. We have the kinds of findings happening from the researchers and then we have the applications of those within policy, but it also goes the other way. What's done with policy then affects what we might find with a scientific investigation. And it's just so neat to see all of these lanes interconnected and the ways that communication and knowledge can be shared. You know, Britt, it it reminds me a lot of what we talked about in season one with this idea of the importance, not just of communicating, but of listening to what's being communicated and the power of two-way dialogue to learn from perhaps somewhat unexpected voices. You know, one, one of the things that I loved in the interview with Lilani was this concept of the seat at the table and making sure that the seats at the table were there for new voices and perhaps the unexpected voices to give some perspectives and to add value that wouldn't otherwise be there. I completely agree. And I was just really inspired to see that there is an option for early career researchers, that there are these incredibly amazing and complicated structures that have space for, you know, someone like me, someone like Lilani. And then to also see that this kind of a thing is valued, not just by the fellows and, you know, their mentors and IPBIS, but by the wider community, even to the private sector. And what happens with those networks, I think, can only be moving onward and upward as we head into the next year and beyond. So that's it for this first episode of Nature Insight, Speed Dating with the Future, Season 2. I'm Rob Spall. And I'm Britt Garner. In our next episode, we'll be peeking behind that curtain finding out how assessments are coordinated and delivered, not just by hundreds of experts from every corner of the globe, 
but also by some of the amazing technical people behind the assessment process. So I'll be speaking to Hien Ngo. Hien was the head of the technical support unit for the IPTAS Global Assessment. She'll be telling us all about what's involved behind the scenes, in the author meetings, in the public reviews, and those all important late night intergovernmental negotiations. Ooh la la, see that's what I'm here for. <laughs> you know, it's great to hear what goes on behind closed doors. So make sure you subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. And please do rate and review us so we know what you think and let others know about the series if you think they would enjoy it too. If you'd like to find out more about the IPBIS Fellowship or even explore opportunities to participate in the fellowship, search the web for IPBIS Fellowship. That's I-P-B-E-S Fellowship. You can also learn more about IPBIS's work on www.ipbes.net or on any of our social media channels. Just search for at IPBES. That's at I-P-B-E-S. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week with episode two.